Thank you all so much for being here. Tonight we're going to discuss Brown versus the Board of Education and the backlash to public education. Sherman, would you like to give us an introduction? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. My name is Sherman Henry. I'm a faculty member at the Labor Education and Research Center at the University of Oregon. Tonight we have a, a great panelist uh, with Dr. Johnson and Dr. Lafer. Uh, who will kind of give an overview of the historical context of Brown versus Board of Education and the backlash to public education and how it impacts uh, unionizations in, in, in various uh, communities. So today we start from a place where sometimes what is legal is not just. Our country has a legacy of unjust legal laws that continues to shape our cultural norms and collective experience in society. I reflect on today's legal system, the history of school segregation, Jim Crow laws, redlining and housing, the right to work laws, the exclusion of specific working people from the National Labor Relations Act, 1935, minimum wage laws uh, at the federal and state levels. These legal frames were, and in some cases are legal, but today remain unjust. Uh, by some scholars like our panelists, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Lafer's workers' rights uh, has been under siege. And so we can have this debate about the merits of these laws and how they impact our society in the 21st century economy. And as we think about workers' rights uh, and promoting unionization, we seek to cultivate a social justice lens to call for reform to what has been a living legacy of white supremacy, its influence, and the legal disenfranchisement of people of color and working people all across the land. The recent workers suppression law, voters, voters registration suppression law, Senate Bill 202 signed into law by the governor of Georgia is an indication that this work continues to be uh, needed, that we have to fight for the just society. 66, about 66 years ago, Brown versus Board of Education was deemed a turning point, a ruling by the Supreme Court to right some of the wrongs of racism in the American economic system. But the political economy continues to remind us of class segregation, class battles, and racism for the ownership and the rights for educated population. So as we reflect on all of the stakeholders' needs in pursuit of happiness and knowledge, our interest in an equitable education system for all remains a dream. Uh, at the same time, we're witnessing the nightmare of legalized underfunding of public education systems that derails so many of our hopes and dreams and cripples teachers' rights, cripples students' rights, cripples uh, support services' rights, and as we kind of reimagine how we move forward with reform and address all of the wrongs that have occurred in this last uh, couple of decades. So tonight our panelists will share their research and their lived experience and knowledge about our embattled educational system and how workers through this process and reflecting on the backlash to board, Brown versus Board of Education and the permanence of racism, uh, systemic racism. So Jennifer, uh, will give a kind of overview of how the flow would uh, occur. And then I'll subsequently uh, introduce Gordon Lafer and our friend and brother of the AFT Oregon, Jaime Rodriguez will introduce Dr. Uh, Loretta Johnson and then Dr. Johnson will start off this conversation. Jennifer. Thank you, Sherman. Yes, we'll have presentations from Dr. Johnson and Dr. Lafer, and then we'll have a really good amount of time for discussion, um, conversation, and questions towards the end. I'm happy for you to ask your own questions uh, during that segment towards the end, or at any time you can uh, put questions in the chat, and I'll look for those and um, call those forward at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So our good friend, Dr. Lafer Gordon, uh, joint Lurk faculty in 1997. His work focuses primarily on industrial and policy research, and he has written widely on the issues of economic and employment policy. In 2009 through 2010, 
Brother Leif also worked as a uh, senior policy advisor for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Education and Labor. Uh, Gordon teaches extensive courses on internal and external organizing, contract negotiations, and labor policies. And on campus, he has taught several on leaders. He has taught several leaders on labor and employment policies for the U of O Political Science Department and, had, and the Clark's Honors College. Gordon is also the author of a book, The 1% Solution, How Corporate America uh, Are Remaking America on the State at a Time, One State at a Time. And so Gordon would also contribute to this conversation about how charter schools is part of this 1% solution that's taken fundings away from our public education system. Brother Jaime, want to introduce Dr. Johnson. You talking to me? No, no, Jaime's supposed to do your introduction. Okay. He's muted now. There we go. It's taken a while to find me, but uh, and welcome, yeah. Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much, Sherman. Uh, again, Jaime Rodriguez, president of AFT Oregon and proud member of the Oregon chapter of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. Uh, Loretta Johnson is currently secretary treasurer emeritus of the American Federation of Teachers, AFL-CIO. She was elected to this position of AFT secretary treasurer in July 2011 and served through July 2020. Before becoming AFT secretary treasurer, Johnson was the union's executive vice president from 2008 to 2011. She was also she also served as president of the Baltimore Teachers Union Paraprofessionals Chapter for 35 years, as, pre as president of AFT Maryland for 17 years. In 2014, Johnson chaired the AFT Racial Racial Equity Task Force, leading the AFT to become the first public sector union in modern history to issue a substantive action-oriented report on achieving racial equity in America, reclaiming the promise of racial equity in education, economics, and our criminal justice system. Thank you for that, leading that report, Dr. Johnson. Johnson started her career in 1966 as a teacher's aide in a Baltimore elementary school, where she earned 225 an hour and received no benefits. We have come a long way, Dr. Johnson, a long way, thank you. To improve the work situations of paraprofessionals like herself, she organized them into the Baltimore Teachers Union. In 1970, she negotiated the union's first contract, which was especially not notable because of it, grievance procedures. That experience laid the foundation for Johnson's union teacher activism. Her efforts have helped the BTU become a lobbying and political force in City Hall, the Baltimore community, and the Maryland State Legislature and the BTU is one of the most promising of all locals of AFT. Thanks for your leadership there, Dr. Johnson. Over the years, she has served as chief negotiator for many other teacher and paraprofessionals contracts as well. Johnson earned her teaching degree through the career opportunity programs at Coppin State University in Maryland. She has received numerous honors and awards, including an honorary doctorate from Coppin State, a Community Service Award from the United Way, and a Volunteer Service Award from the Maryland State AFL-CIO. She also received the Albert Schenker PSRP Pioneer Award and a Service Award for the Baltimore Teachers Union Paraprofessionals Chapter. And I'm leaving out a whole lot of other awards uh, due to time constraints, Dr. Johnson. As you know, uh, Johnson is the proud mother of three children whom she raised with her hus late husband, Leonard, and she has eight grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren who are fortunate, I'm sure, to have you as their grandmother. Welcome, Dr. Loretta Johnson. Thank you, and thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you. Do you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, you know, the struggle for racial justice and I would say education justice, it is so important that we understand the history behind the landmark court case we thinking about today, Brown versus the Board of Education. 
Why? Because it underscores how closely linked education and equality are. But let me tell you, Brown versus the Wood was not perfect. No, far from it. It was important, of course, but in many ways, we failed to fulfill the promise. I know we love to applaud the old black and white photographs of people like Ruby Bridges and the Little Rack Nine and integrating schools in the South. Pictures of them now. Remember those faces full of determination, even the mobs of white people yelling hateful words Jed even spit on them, didn't want them to go into the schools. We think their courage and motive and their persistence and the defiance saved us. They were black children who finally made it into white schools, but Brown did not fix discrimination. Our public schools are still segregated. And I'm gonna say that again. Our public schools are still segregated. After all these fights and all the marches and all the unwelcoming going on over these school years, 67 years later, today, our children are still attending segregated schools. They can't take the same languages, foreign languages, engineers, special classes, black children and brown children are still struggling to get the basics, which outdated textbooks, crumbling schools, and they just don't have the facilities or the teachers that they need to have a quality education not only teachers, but support staff. It takes a village to educate our students, our custodians, our food service, our bus drivers, and our paraprofessionals in the classroom. This was not the plan. When Brown passed it in 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren called education a right, which must be made available to all equal on equal term. Thurgood Marshall, who later became the first black justice to sit on the Supreme Court, linked education to the right of every American to have equal start in life. It was the idea of equality that has inspired these men. That inspired the decision that was supposed to desegregate our schools. It was the idea that all children, all races could learn together in high quality public schools. But that vision went unfulfilled. Today, segregation is worse than ever. The civil rights projects reports right now in 2016, 40% of black students attend schools with 90% or more students of color. That's nearly half of our black children going to school and nearly all black students. That is segregation. In some places it's even more dramatic. 65% of the black children in New York go to schools in intense segregated schools, which means they go to schools where 90 to 100% of the students are students of color. This is what Brown versus the board was aiming for. No, it was not. What's happening? Well, I believe that even a court case like Brown versus the board is not enough to overcome the long history of discrimination in this country. When you enslave an entire people, my people, for 250 years, and then you later come with Jim Crow laws that prevent us from thriving, and you cannot expect all that to just go away 
when you win a lawsuit. You also have to overcome housing discrimination. You have to recognize that neighborhoods of black people are typically poorer than white neighborhoods and their property taxes can't support the high quality schools like the white neighborhoods can. And you have to remember that redesigning has kept black families from owning their own homes in what we consider the best neighborhoods and the best schools. You have to remember that black people have had a hard time and still have a hard time competing in a job market that still favors white people. And maybe this is the most important part as I can see it. A lawsuit is not enough to erase the deep racial bias still held by so many Americans. It is not enough to change hearts and minds that still feel and think that black children may be cute as pie, but they do not deserve the same highly quality learning and experience. Let me tell you, as a black woman with black children and black grandchildren and great grandchildren, that, that is wrong. But some people believe that some people believe that black children don't deserve a good public education. How do we change that? How do we change hearts and minds? There is work that we have to do. We have to have a conversation with one another. We have to sit down and walk through these issues that have created the problems so far. But I guess you didn't ask me to come to the Zoom meeting today just for a lecture about the importance of equality. I think I'm right. I sure hope I'm right when I say that whoever is listening to this today already know that every child deserves an equal, high quality education, an equal opportunity to graduate from high school, go to college. And if that is the choice of them to do, to find a stable, fulfilling career to thrive in. Every kid don't wanna to go to college, but every kid should have the opportunity to find a good job that fulfill and care that thrive. We came to talk about equality, but we can also talk about how charter schools interrupted it and how they created an uneven playing field so you want to come up with the whining of me and have nots, which basically what charter schools have done, they have an administration of have and the public schools have become the have nots. I do want to recognize the charter schools started out with good intentions, I believe that. They were going to innovative places they were uh, uh, and thinking about how they could do experiments with new approaches to learning, places that could be less restricted to pu than public school rules and regulation. And some of them do this, and some of them are successful, but most of them are not. And in fact, some are so poorly run that they have to shut down. A report last year showed that more than a quarter of the charter schools closed after opening just five years and about half closed after 15 years. Think of how many students' lives are interrupted when that happens. Too often charters are not so much schools as they like management organizations that pass public education dollars onto private companies. They suck the money out of the public school budgets. We were already not funded. Now we're sharing our money with the, with the private schools and the charter schools has created less funding for the public schools. The schools are paid per student. And the worst of them keep their students on the rosters only as long as it takes to collect the money. And by the way, they don't give no money back if the kids don't show up. 
like public schools, if you don't spend the budget, you have to give it back and use it next year. That might be the child who needs extra help learning to read or one who is emotionally learning issues. Every one of the children deserve a good education. They cannot get a, a good education with less money and, and the charter schools make it hard for the public schools. Then a lot of times the charter schools dump the kids out of the system who can't bring their test scores up. So meanwhile, instead of investing in public schools to make them better, the states are supporting the charters, districts are starving the public schools so severely that they cannot afford the teachers, the books, the basic infrastructure like heat and air condition to keep their students safe and learning. They are viewed as failing because no surprise, their test scores go down. And in some cases, those underfunded, neglected public schools finally close. Charter schools are all part of the equations. Now let's go back to the history lesson. Yes, also say that charters are the new vouchers. Vouchers started back when Brown versus the board was the first decided and white families refused to let their white children mix with the little black children in the class. So the entire district closed their schools rather than allow the children to attend schools together. And so where did the kids go? Well, the white families got vouchers and basically big fat checks from the government and they sent their children to private schools for white students only. This is probably not news to you, but the role vouchers played is an important reminder of us to us today. Back then, white families abandoned the public schools. So they decided they attend all white schools they call segregated academies. They weren't hiding, you know, they liked segregated and they got it. So if those white children took that taxpayer money away from public schools, just like charter schools take money away from public schools today, and we spend it all on white private schools, what happens to the black kids? Well, they're out of luck. In some places, the district shut down all the schools so they wouldn't have to integrate them. The kids went off to their private schools and the black kids they had no schools. This really happened in places like Prince George's County, Virginia. Black mothers and black fathers were making the painful choice to send their children away to, relatively, to relatives who lived in the Northern states just so they could get an education or they cobbled together on education at home. Many of the older children, the teenagers, just never finished high school. Our charter schools are like the vouchers of the post Brown area. They take away money from the public school system. And while some people praise them for giving families a choice, that choice is not as great as you might think. Imagine your child, public school is underfunding. The ceilings are leaking. There's no gym. The teachers are mostly substitutes and the books are decades old then you get then you get the choice to go to the charter school but the charter school is, is scrimping on student services it's well-paid administrators and high teachers who are underqualified and underpaid it may even be involved in one of the many charter school scandals around real estate schemes and privates and jets for big wigs. So what kind of choice is that? Well, I will tell you, it's the sort of choice that tells me us, we should have work to do or combat segregation and inequity in our schools. You know, with COVID-19, 
16. Biggest problem with opening our schools, our public schools, had to be with poor buildings. Ventilation in those buildings. We could not even return our kids without funding to go in and do what should have been done without having COVID-19. And this is the problem when you get afraid to go back. It has nothing to do with not wanting to go back. Most teachers want to be in school. It is the underfunding of our schools that has created such an issue of equality and what is supposed to be fair and equitable equality. So I'm interested in hearing what more you have to say about this and what ideas you might have to finally fulfill the broken promise of the board versus uh, a Brown versus the board. I was in high school when that decision was made and I was in an all black high school uh, in 1954. And I chose to stay in that black high school. It's so important to us of the issues that's going on and Brown versus the board has not been fulfilled. We still have a lot of work to do. And I thank you for this opportunity and I'll be prepared to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And so the next panelist, Gordon Lafer, would actually fill in the gap on some of the adverse conditions that we face in public education uh, through his research on charter schools. Brother Gordon. Thank you. I'm just going to try to uh, share my screen here. OK. Um, first of all, I just want to say what an honor it is to be on a panel with Dr. Johnson. Um, and I've, I've been last uh, decade, most of my research has been looking at charter schools, mostly in California, which is the biggest charter school industry in the country. Um, obviously, there's good and bad charter schools. And the question is not about any particular charter school, but what is the impact of this industry as a whole and the growth of charter schools as a movement? And I want to talk about this specifically in terms of racial equity. And it, it's a weird issue because I would say the effect of the growth of the charter industry has been to break unions and to privatize education. And all of that is overwhelmingly concentrated in poor cities of color. If you look at where the places where the biggest percentage of students are enrolled in charter schools, it's not affluent suburbs. It's Oakland, California, St. Louis, Chicago, Memphis, Milwaukee, New Orleans, Washington, DC. It's all poor black and brown cities. And yet with that said, uh, one of the things that comes up in the debates around charter schools is that the charter industry promotes itself on the grounds of equity and saying we need to have more charter schools and have them grow more specifically as an equity agenda. So I want to try to talk about the sum and unpack what really is the impact of, of not of any individual charter schools, but of the charter school industry as a whole. Uh, so again, just to talk about the, the debate that has gone on about this, you can see charter schools have been controversial uh, in general and within uh, black advocacy organizations also controversial. In 2016, the national NAACP and the movement for black lives both called for a national moratorium saying no new charter schools should be approved. At the same time, that call was opposed by a number of uh, organizations, including one uh, headed by Cheryl Brown Henderson, the daughter of the plaintiff in Brown v. Board, who said essentially what, what this quote has here, which is charter schools make it possible for urban black families to do what affluent families have long been able to do to rescue their children from failing schools. So this is like the argument that is made about equity. They say the public school system has failed, uh, has failed a lot of students, especially in poor communities. And just like rich white families can choose where they wanna send their kids, we need charter schools so that black and brown families can also make that same choice. So again, I think the, the question about charter schools 
is uh, is not if one is good or bad, but what is the effect of the industry as a whole? And as Dr. Johnson said, the, what the charter school industry is now is very different from how it was initially conceived. This is a, a quote from the guy who authored the, the law to uh, first legalize charter schools in California in 1992. And his idea was that charter schools would be a small number of experiments where a group of teachers or parents or community could get out from under the bureaucracy of the school system to try something innovative. And he said, this will be like a research and development laboratory and the rest of the school system would learn from the, from the best successes of charter schools. So this is everybody's idea of what charter schools are supposed to be, but it was never written into law. It was never written into law that there would be a cap, that it would only be a small number. And it was never written into law that they have to do something that is new, different, or better than what already exists in, in your by public schools. So just um, as an example, I said, my, my research has mostly been in California. In California now, three quarters of charter schools, and there's over 1,200 charter schools in California, three quarters of them have worse performance, meaning worse uh, reading and math scores than nearby public schools that serve demographically similar population students. So we have, we have many millions of dollars opening hundreds of new schools, um, which don't do anything better, don't do anything new. And we're essentially creating a second school system alongside the public system that is publicly funded, but privately run. And in the course of doing this, as Dr. Johnson said, sucking money out of and defunding the traditional public schools. Um, the, the fact that a lot of students have been failed in traditional public school systems is obviously true. And for, for teachers unions, for people certainly including myself who are believers in and defenders of public education, the answer can't just be kill all the charter schools, everything is fine in the public school system, don't change anything. Obviously there's, there's a lot of things that need to be improved in the public school system. But the idea that you could improve them simply by shifting from public schools to charter schools, which is what's been pushed in many states where they say um, any school that has low test scores for a certain number of years automatically has to be privatized and turned into a charter school, that idea has no basis in fact. This is an example from Ohio. Cleveland was one of the early cities that enabled charter schools and that enabled online charter schools. This is in one of their first years of operation, 2013, all six of the online charter schools in Ohio, which educated almost 35,000 students were graded F on the state report card. But they remain in operation. All these schools are still in operation today. So we see it is simply switching from public schools to charter schools is not, doesn't do anything to improve education. Um, I would say when we look at charter schools as a whole and say, so what is the problem with a charter school industry? I think there's three problems. One is the model of schools that is being offered and that is being promoted. Um, a second is the way that uh, traditional public schools and school districts are defunded and undermined by the growth of charter schools. And the third is the way that charter schools are being used eventually to push complete privatization of schooling. So let me start by talking about the kind of model that is being that is actually available to people as charter schools. Because we hear this said all the time, like rich white families can choose where to send their kids to school. Shouldn't poor black and brown families be able to do the same thing? Obviously the answer is yes. But the places where rich white families send their kids to school, that option is not on the menu. That's not one of the choices being offered to poor families. This slide, for example, shows the school where Rahm Emanuel sends his kids. Rahm Emanuel, former mayor of Chicago, fought the unions in Chicago, closed hundreds of public schools and opened a lot of charter schools in Chicago. His kids went to the University of Chicago Laboratory School where there's a student teacher ratio of 10 to one. They have seven full-time art teachers and three libraries. The school says that quote, physical education, world languages, libraries and the arts are not frills but an essential piece of a well-rounded education. Their teachers are highly trained and experienced and are not evaluated based on test scores. So I could say, you know, my proposal for education policy in a sentence, which is everybody's kids should be able to get the education that Rom's kids get. But that's not what's be being offered in charter schools. What's being offered is a much more degraded model of education. And this is just one example. This is a a chain of charter schools that uh, grew up in the Bay Area in California and is now being promoted in poor cities around the country. 
And this was something that Jennifer Smith and I worked on when they were coming to Milwaukee. The, the Wisconsin legislature said, any schools that persistently fail, which means they had low test scores for two years in a row, which means all the poor schools, because the only thing that correlates to test scores really strongly is poverty. They said those would have to be forcibly closed and converted to charter schools. And the chain they were promoting was rocket ship education, which they said, this is the gold standard of education for kids in Milwaukee. Here's how the school works. Students spend one quarter of the day in teacherless computer labs where they're hooked up to like video game based apps that's like, you know, solve the math program problem to cross the river or something like that. A quarter of the day without teachers. They have young, cheap and inexperienced teachers. A third of the teachers quit and are replaced every year, but the, the uh, charter school contracts with Teach for America to continually supply new recruits. Their curriculum is almost entirely reduced to just what's on the test, to just reading and math. So they have no gym, no playgrounds, no recess, no music, no art, no physical education, no library, no foreign languages, no counselors. Even within reading and math, what they do is almost exclusively teaching to the test. They, te they do the standardized test that we do once a year, eight times a year. And after each test, they say, Let's figure out where the kids didn't do well and prep them for that for the next time they take the test. So it's as close as you could get to all test prep all year long. Now, this is what's being promoted in Milwaukee and other places as the gold standard for kids in poor communities. And this was this is what was said by the Chamber of Commerce in Milwaukee. So uh, Jennifer Smith from from Lurk and I said, huh, I wonder what the school are like that the kids of the Chamber of Commerce leaders go to in Wisconsin. And these are those schools. So in their kids' schools, they have a student-teacher ratio that's about half what it is in rocket ship. They have experienced teachers. They have art, music, foreign languages, libraries, counselors, and all their classes are in person. So what we see is two completely def different definitions. They say, here's the gold standard for poor kids in Milwaukee. And here's a completely different standard for wealthier kids. The, what's called the gold standard in Milwaukee wouldn't even make it onto the scale for the schools that the actual people who run the Chamber of Commerce send their kids to. So I think one of the things that we see nationally in education and in, in corporate backed education reform and in charter schools is the degradation of the idea of what kind of education does my kid have a right to deserve? And this is, I think, one of the most powerful things in education is that if you ask people in America, what are the things we have a right to just by virtue of living here? It's a very short list. You know, we don't have a right to air. You don't have a right to a house. You don't necessarily have a right to food and water. But people think I have a right for my kid to get a decent education and I have a right to have the mail delivered. And both those things are heavily under attack not just the institutions, but also the idea that we have a right for it. And part of what's happening in charter schools is saying, you think you have a right to an education, don't think that includes a library or drama or small classes or even in-person classes. There's a degraded idea of education that's being pushed through the charter industry for poor cities around the country. So I think that's the first problem is a change in what, what do we think education is that our kids deserve. The second thing is as, as Dr. Johnson described, the way that charter schools defund and suck money out of public schools. And essentially, you know, this is, um, if we didn't have charter schools and we said, well, we're just gonna have the public school system and anybody who wants can open a school any place they want of any quality, it would be like the poster child for government waste because we'd be producing too many schools and we'd be putting a lot of money into buildings and administration instead of classrooms. The way charter schools work is, if a, if a state pays, let's say $10,000 per student is the total state funding, then when a student moves from a public school to a charter school, their $10,000 goes with them. But if you think about a school, let's say a school loses 10% of its students. So its average class size goes from 30 to 27. They may not even be able to lay off a single teacher in terms of saving costs. If they can get rid of a couple of teachers, they certainly, they still have to have their principal, their assistant principal, their custodian, their cafeteria, their transportation service. They have to pay the heat. They have to do snow removal. So there's all of these fixed costs that can't be reduced, but they still lose all this money. They lose $10,000 per student. And because those costs can't, because the fixed costs can't be changed, they end up having to make cuts in the classroom, 
of having bigger class size, of having science experiments demonstrated instead of kids having science labs, cutting all kinds of things. This is just an example if you think of what are the fixed costs. And this is research that, that has been done in different parts of the country um, over the last decade. And all of the serious research finds between 35 and 50% of costs are fixed costs, which means if you lose $10,000 per kid, between 3,500 and 5,000 of that is a cost that you can't make up in savings by educating fewer kids and therefore get cuts made in services to the students. I was part of a study that looked at, uh, especially at Oakland and San Diego in California. And this is, without getting into the details, I'll just, you know, to give you the, the punchline, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, we came out and, and estimated that in, if you look at that middle line that says annual economic impact, that in San Diego, the district every year is losing $65 million a year net, which means money that they've lost that they can't make up in cost savings by educating fewer students as the cost of having an unregulated charter, charter industry. In Oakland, where I've mostly concentrated, they're losing $57 million a year. And by the way, I can tell you these numbers are uncontested. We came out with these numbers and the Charter School Association said, oh, this, is a, this study is illegitimate. And we said, okay, well, can you tell us a number that you think is wrong? And they couldn't point to any individual number. So when you say, <clears throat> what does it mean for Oakland to lose $57 million every year as the cost of having a big charter school, charter sector? Now in Oakland, uh, Oakland is one of the cities with a very big charter industry. 30% of the students in Oakland are enrolled in charter schools. But that means 70% of the students are enrolled in traditional public schools. And as Dr. Johnson said, because charter schools are able to screen out kids, the neediest students, uh, students who have the highest and most expensive to serve special needs, students whose families are homeless or itinerant, students cycling in and out of juvenile justice, um, unaccompanied minors who cross the border and show up in Oakland in need of all kinds of services. None of those kids are in charter schools. All those kids are in the public schools. For $57 million a year in Oakland, the district could cut class size to 18 in all of elementary school, could double the number of nurses and counselors and still have 10 million bucks a year left over to do other things. So not doing this is the price that students in Oakland public schools pay in order to have this big charter school sector. So again, the, the issue is not, there are individual good charter schools and bad charter schools. On the average, they're the same national average, it's, it's a wash. But the question is, how big do you want this sector to be? And right now somebody could say, oh, we, we want choice. We want parents to be able to have choice. We should have unlimited growth in charter schools. So the cost of having unlimited growth in charter schools in Oakland is having huge class sizes and insufficient nurses and counselors and, and many other things missing for the poorest and neediest students in the system. So this is the second, um, the second problem with the charter industry is the way that it systematically defunds and undermines the public education system. And the last thing is the way in which the charter industry is being used by some corporate lobbies and by some ideological advocates intentionally to try to destroy the public education system. This is, um, I don't know if you can see the title, this is the director of something called the Center for Reinventing Public Education which is based at the University of Washington, but is not, is not faculty, uh, is a think tank founded by the, funded by the Gates Foundation. And she says, the theory of action in the charter industry for the last 10 to 15 years has been what she called the tipping point strategy. And the idea was to concentrate growth, concentrate growth of charter schools in targeted cities until districts either responded to competition or were entirely replaced by charter schools. So to a large degree, their idea is to crash the system, to make it, you know, to, to put such financial pressure on public school districts that they collapse. And many of these people say, our goal is that there shouldn't be publicly run schools, that there should just be charter schools. And New Orleans now is the first district that I believe is entirely charter schools. And it should work the way any market should work. You have your $10,000 per kid and you go wherever you wanna go. If we go back to you know the thing I said a little a little while ago, where I think the idea that your kid has you 
for your kid a right to a decent education is one of the only rights we still think we have just by virtue of living in the United States. And a lot of people's kids get crappy education, but at least there's somebody to go and yell at. What they want education to become is like what health insurance is. I don't know anybody who doesn't hate their health insurance company once, once they actually need something from it. But like, what are you gonna do? There's nobody whose job, even in theory, is to guarantee that you have good and affordable health insurance. So you could blame yourself. I should have been a better consumer. I should have worked out more. I shouldn't have eaten what I ate. I should have whatever. There's, no, there's nothing like that. You can hate it, but there's nothing to do. The end goal that a lot of the people behind the, the aggressively pushing the charter industry want to get to is that it will look like that. Everybody will have a chunk of money they get from the state. It won't be enough to buy a good education, but nobody's promising you anything else. And if you get a bad education for your kids, it may be because you were a bad consumer. And the place where we see this, I think one of the most chilling places in Michigan, which is one of the states with the highest percentage of charter schools, especially in Detroit, um, there was a lawsuit filed by a number of community groups who said the quality of education in Detroit charter schools is terrible and it's in violation of the state constitution, which guarantees every student a right to education. And the Michigan Supreme Court, this was 2014, came back and actually ruled. They said, you don't have a right to a decent education. The Constitution says you have a right to an education, but it doesn't say what quality it has to be or that it has to be decent quality. And I think this is chilling. And one of the things that goes along with the charter industry's most aggressive growth is wanting to get to the point where we forget the idea that education should be something that every kid has a right to and that it just becomes a market and a market where rich people will still get what Rahm Emanuel's kids get and everybody else will get the crappy degraded education that rocket ship promoted in Baltimore. So I'm uh, sorry to be such a downer, but let me stop there. And uh, I'm also happy to hear other people's thoughts and questions. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting and yes, kind of depressing. There are a few questions in the chat. Um, Sherman, if you don't mind me holding your question off until a little bit later, it's such a broad and far reaching question. Maybe I'll um, sure. ask some of the nuts and bolts type questions I'm seeing in chat. And also, I welcome you to raise your hand too if you want to ask your own question. I see Mark Tishner says um, regarding school budgets primarily funded through property taxes, um, as Dr. Johnson was saying, is an issue in the um, inequity of schools. What recommendations can you offer to assist lower income area school districts to compensate for this difference in the amount of funding? Are there any innovative ideas about equalizing um, budgets? Or are we just stuck? Are we just stuck with uh, you know what our property taxes are? I can. I, I Dr. Johnson may have other thoughts. I'll, I'll throw out one thought, which is um, not every place is it based on property tax. In Oregon, it's not based on property tax; it's state funding. Um, and the most, um, but still in in Oregon, the quality of schools has been degraded year after year since the mid '90s, when caps on on taxes were voted in by constitutional amendment. The most promising thing that I know of is last fall in Arizona, um, Arizona voted by ballot initiative to institute a new tax on the richest people in the state and devote that tax to increase school funding. And this Arizona is, a, is not a blue state, you know, I barely went for Biden, but it's a fairly conservative state. A lot of people who voted for President Trump also voted for this. Uh, it's a very strong bipartisan support for increase funding for taxing the rich. So I think in places where it's possible to do that by ballot initiative, that's one promising direction to. And Dr. Johnson, do you have any thoughts on that question? I didn't hear the question. In a lot of places, uh, there's uh, school inequity, as you pointed out, it's uh, a function of property taxes and how um, you know, wealthier areas have, have access to higher property taxes and therefore can afford to fund better funded schools. Uh, are there any um, other 
options that you've seen in, in your work that um, kind of can equalize the playing field a little bit irrespective of property taxes? Well, here in Maryland, we were able to, uh, I was on a commission um, that the governor appointed me to about, I guess it's been about almost 15 years ago, where we made funding for education a part of the budget. Our constitution holds the state responsible for education, not the locales. Okay. The locales are supposed to support whatever the state gives. And so we were able to remove uh, using taxes, home, uh, the taxes of homes and put it in a line item budget uh, uh, and force the state to budget for our schools all around the um, state. So we just got a, an addition to that. Uh, it was called the Thornton Commission and now the Kerwin Commission just finished and put a lot more money into uh, the subdivisions that have special need kids and needed more support. For example, the Baltimore City um, um, will get a large portion uh, more than the surrounding rich counties of that money into the school system to help build new new schools um, and right now they have a, a bond of 75 million that uh, the state has to help build new schools in Baltimore City. So that's an example of coming up with different ways to fund the schools other than taxes on people's homes. Thank you. Um, that that I, that I know of and that even with the taxes on people's homes, um, most um, citizens support public education and they're willing to pay, mm -hmm. but they're not willing to put that kind of money into the state if it's not directed to education. Mm -hmm. So it must be a line item in the budget that the governors cannot manipulate the monies, you know, to get bonds for education uh, and uh, the best example of that is the casinos. It says it's for education <laughs> and the state is taking part of that money. It's not going directly. All of it's not going into education. Right, thank you. So I, you know, I think that um, it's very important that parents is educated on going into their legislature and forcing uh, more funding for education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have another question in the chat and it's from Tressa Jarrell and she outlines a, a very thorough process for developing um, state curriculum, at least in Oregon, um, mm -hmm. and what kind of um, you know, curriculum to mm -hmm. adopt each year. I guess it's a seven year rotation. Um, and she asks, um, does current legislation address these vetted publisher materials to include a deeper look through an equity lens? The charter schools in Medford are through contract with the local school district. What are the rules for charter schools concerning state standards and vetted materials for curriculum? And I think particularly um, with an equity lens in education. And, and Teresa, if, if I've misrepresented your question, please don't hesitate to pipe in and clarify. Are you well, that, yeah, are you seeing that more, Dr. Johnson, in, in various states, how um, schools are like incorporating and in, you know equity and inclusion curriculum? Enough. You know, I got the best example of charter schools in Maryland because charter schools are part of collective bargaining. And all of our teachers are treated the same way. So the education um, structure is set by the state. Now the charter schools can do innovative programs within their schools that different from 
what I would say the regular public schools, but they must follow the academic structure of the public schools uh, set by statewide school board. And so they have to have certain academics in their schools besides the innovative areas that they put into the schools. Now that's here in Maryland. That is not, an, a, I can't say that is an example all across the country of, of, uh, of charter schools because our charter schools are not break, broke, broken away from our school board. Our school board supervise our charter schools. Dr. Lafer, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I, I just know, as Dr. Johnson said, it really varies state by state. In many states, charter schools, I think Maryland is probably the exception in how they're... Um, yeah, we don't know one with that. Mm -hmm. uh, in many states, charters get, get a blanket waiver from almost all school regulations, except for the fire code or something like that, uh, and anti-discrimination laws. But not only are they don't go, curriculum doesn't go through the same vetting thing, but if the state passes a law, says, Everybody needs to study ethnic studies. Everybody needs to study those. In many states, those laws don't apply to charter schools because they're exempted from, from all of the school system laws except for a very few bare bones. Mm. And I, I, I think to add to that is, is, is a way to bring charter schools in line. They have to have supervision of the states the same way public schools and that they don't have total control over the whole academic structure of the schools because what they're trying to do is make money. And so the only way to make money because they don't cut their administration costs, as I just saw, you know, they, they create a whole new uh, 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 administration that they have to pay for. They lease in a building. And, and they're trying to get all of that out of um, our dollars and not really doing a funding type of situation. And so that creates a problem for them because they can't make a profit. So what they do is they cut in the education line across the board and that's where they squeeze their money at. So, um, you know, we have to fight um, charter schools that are put together like that in a private structure because they don't service the community. They're servicing the school, the board. They have their own board, by the way. Um, their own, own board, uh, each school sets up their own board who makes a decision of how to spend our money, mm -hmm. which I call the taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. It's not the board's money. And so therefore, that would be a way of trying to reel in some of these charter schools because like Baltimore, the private for-profit will not come because we have a state law and it's under control. So they're not gonna come into Maryland, but they will go into other areas that don't have those kind of laws. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, in Ohio, as you pointed out, um, Ohio had about nine schools that shut down and the public schools had to take them, take them over because otherwise kids would have no school to go to. The public schools then tried to get the facilities and all of the supplies that public dollar had paid for. And when they went to court, the judge said, I want to give you this, but the contract that the school board signed gave all of the equipment, furniture to this private company that public dollars paid for. So the school system had to buy that stuff back in order to be able to service the kids. That should not be happening. Those were public dollars. 
And so that we, if the more we educate parents to this, that they're not schools of choice. And they go in the black community and that's what they say. You have a fail in public schools and, oh yes, this will give you a choice. You don't have to send your child to this fail in public school. We'll take care of you. And most parents, that sounds good. If your child is failing and have problems, they don't see it. Um, we are not reaching out to that parent. Then they want to go to that charter school. And so when they have the bad experience with the charter school, then they don't know what they're supposed to do. Because the charter school is in it for profit, not for and that's basically the study that the NAACP did before they put that halt in 2016. They went out to New Orleans, Ohio, uh, places where they had large charter schools in place, and I think California, and their chapters all found that they were failing. It wasn't as bright a picture in New York it wasn't as bright a picture as was being painted by the media and other sources. And it was a hard decision for the NAACP to make that decision to go to the moratorium. But you notice that helped a lot in the African-American community to start asking questions, to begin to engage with, okay, then, let's put some pressure on our public schools. Let's make sure our public schools are funded. We have such a strong, now, at least AFT does, a strong support in the parental groups out there who are working with us and going in and, and we're showing them how to go to their legislature and get funds for education. And, just not fun for education, but to direct it to instruction in the classroom. It is so important that parents understand the money needs to go to instruction, not to more administrators, not to more salaries, but to the classroom. Following up on what you just said, Dr. Johnson, um, Sherman had asked, um, what role do unions play in addressing public policy and challenge and to challenge systemic racism in school funding? Um, it's kind of in the edge, you know, how to educate the community. Um, what rule did I, I don't know what is my um, equipment here or not, but. I'm having a say it again. Let me read that again. Or, okay. What role do unions play in addressing public policy and to challenge systemic racism in school funding? Oh, um, we've been playing, I think, uh, a, a great role in um, um, addressing um, racism in our, in, in our, um, institution. I think um, we've done a lot of work. Uh, as you well know, um, AFT did a task force. I think the union uh, have been very, very uh, instrumental in um, addressing racism and we've been putting a lot of muscle behind support for the Black Lives Matter school movement. Um, Black Lives Matters at schools and the unions that support its work. Um, we've been doing all of that. We also have developed what we call Share My Lesson. That's the free archives of lesson plans and other resources for educators to share about race and civil rights movement and Black history. And uh, the union can protect workers against discrimination by holding employees accountable uh, we have used the contract to bargain for common good. For example, uh, the work that I did in the legislature, the governor appointed me to the Thornton Commission, was a new commission to come up with funding. Uh, that was my role as a union person. Um, we used the contract 
uh, to push for Office of Diversities, uh, Equity, and, and including all the work to make us sure that there's no discrimination against Black, Latinos, Asians, and Americans, and Pacific Islanders, and Indigenous people. Um, and we've established a professional development program to help people of color to advance their career, establish college fund for children. We have done a lot to break the cycle of generational poverty by providing the opportunity to advance and grow. And we do preserve union jobs. Uh, example, COVID-19, uh, the nurses and, and, and the assistants on the front line, we, we went out and bought PPEs for them um, and, and equipment so they could do the job when they couldn't get it from the boss. Uh, the union played a role in COVID-19 uh, in working with our students virtually setting up small classroom for the special needs, needed children. So the union tried to play a role, not only um, representing our members um, in, in a contract, but representing the community that we serve, and that's children. I wanna say that um, our Jamie Rodriguez, our, our local um, Oregon AFT, up here on the call today has said that um, although AFT and it's correct that AFT has been instrumental but beyond you know being involved in the union we need to elect labor candidates and also hold current legislators and our school boards accountable um, how how much how much of a role do school boards play in allowing um, charter schools to um, Put out their shingle in our in our school districts. Is that just a, is that a state um, decision or is that um, a, a district by district decision? Well, in in our district, the school board plays a big role because it supervises the um, uh, the school district. But in the other districts, school boards uh, they have laws. They have set up laws laws that allow the school, uh, the charter schools to have its own board. So it's so important that we run for school board positions. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree wholeheartedly with you that um, um, in the last election year, the AFT had over 300 of its members running for office, either school board positions or state legislatures, local and national. And we elected over 200 of them. And so it is getting, uh, uh, I mean, the education is finally getting to our members uh, that we have to grasp um, and get and change the laws. In some states, the laws dictate what the charter schools do and they separate them from the um, the boards. And so that means you have to get in there and change that law. Jennifer, can I just weigh in something on the, the role of unions and all this? Please do. Um, I think for a long time, uh, educator unions were in the position of just on the defense, like trying to stop the bombs from falling and, and, and pushing back against a lot of attacks on public education. And that changed in a really dramatic way for a lot of unions, starting with the, the Chicago teacher strike in 2012, which was also an, an AFT affiliated union, that for the first time was a strike. On, of course, it was about money issues, but was also about the, the union's vision of how education should work. They struck for smaller class size, for more nurses and social workers right. in the schools. They, in Chicago, they had to strike over a demand to get textbooks on the first day of the school year because mm -hmm. there were schools that didn't get the textbooks until the middle of October. And, and then that, you know, in a lot of the, the teacher strikes in, uh, in 2018 and 2019, similar things happened in, in Los Angeles, which I think is both uh, AFT and NEA affiliated, the LA Teachers yeah. Unions. West Virginia. Uh, some of the things they were West Virginia too. In Los Angeles, they struck and won, got the district to fund um, 
positions of legal aid for undocumented families to be able to uh, to protect themselves, especially under President Trump's administration. They, they also got funding in their most recent strike uh, to create 25 community schools, which I think in a lot of ways is the, you know, the, the charter industry says, what's the answer to bad public schools for, for poor communities is privatization. And the union movement said, no, it's this thing called community schools where there's wraparound social services and the schools are integrated with a lot of community organizations. And it's somewhat experimental. The LA teachers went on strike and won funding for 25 community schools in LA that are underway now. So I think there's obviously there's a lot a lot way to go, but that education unions have really taken a much a much more um, aggressive and leading role in this in the last decade. Thank you very much. I think we should come to a close, even though there are many more comments and questions out there. I want to thank you all so much for sharing your evening with us and invite you to join us next Wednesday with uh, Professor Daniel Hosang uh, for a talk on racism, austerity, and the public good, the anti-racist imperative for public sector unions. Um, and that'll talk about the decades of attack on public goods and services and the demands for austerity and taxpayer rights and what impact those have had on our public goods. Um, I put a link to register for that in the um, chat and also a request for um, an evaluation of your experience tonight. And um, I'll probably also send you a reminder link tomorrow with that. And Sherman, you wanna close us out? Well, I wanna thank everybody for their time, but I, I wanna just discuss one thing before we close out. And this goes specifically to uh, Gordon's uh, uh, research. The, your report indicate that the separate but equal doctrine uh, continues to not provide equitable uh, education. And so I wanted you to at least talk a little bit about that legacy and how, and, 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 and some of the things that we may do uh, to uh, really address the increase in uh, charter schools and the decrease in public schools quality of education because that 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 whole legacy uh, your report speaks to that issue uh, well in in 30 seconds or or whatever we have you know, <laughs> sure. I, think, you know I can stay I, for hours so go on <laughs> you know as dr. Johnson said we we need to uh, make sure that, if there are charter schools that they're accountable to democratically elected authorities, which is the school board or the state board, somebody elected by parents or by taxpayers. Right now, they're not accountable in any way. They're not subject to this. In most states, they're not subject to the same ethics rules, to the same conflict of interest rules, to the same rules about public records and transparency. And I think, you know, it's really a fight over resources and making sure there are resources where they're most needed in the in the public school system. And we have a system now that doesn't call itself segregation and doesn't say it's divided by race. But when you look at it, where resources are going and also what's the standard of what's considered a good school and bad school, it's very much divided along those lines. And uh, um, I think there there are good examples of, of how it should be working. And Maryland sounds like it's one of them. And it's just a question of political power to get that back. But the, the thing that I think is on our side is that across the political spectrum, uh, people support more money for schools. They support small class sizes. They support well-trained educators. They support a well-rounded education taught in person, Republicans, Democrats, or whatever. And I think we need to find ways to tap into that public support to change the system in that way. Thank you. And on that note, hopefully y'all we will get a chance to uh, talk some more about this and thank everyone for your time and good night. Thank you. See you next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Such a pleasure to hear you and see you.